Okay, so we did record the last session that was posted onto a YouTube channel that we set up. Uh, we will be sharing the links to that channel. So if you do want to go look at past meetups, please go and have a look there. We will have all the videos uploaded on there as well as some other content that we decide to create and post to them. Okay. As usual, if there are any questions or suggestions of info that you would like to see, please post it on the meetup group, reach out to us individually. We want to try and make this as beneficial for you all as possible and so that you're getting the info out and using your time valuably during these sessions. So the agenda for tonight, we are I'm going to be taking you through uh, some new items that are coming into the platform, some events that are coming up and that. Then we're going to hand over to Chris Baxter from the NetBank team. He's going to take us through what their experience has been around establishing a business hub. David's going to take us then through the Power Apps component libraries as well as these pop-out components. We've got Michael's cookbook after that, and then we'll round off with quizzes and some general questions and discussions from everyone if there is time. Now, before we kick off, Michael, David, anything you want to add? I'll take your silence as a no. I see you both still on mute, shaking your head. So, uh -oh. let's, um... <laughs> all good. Okay, okay perfect. You. Okay, so what's in the news at the moment? Cool new things that are coming is you soon going to have the ability to be able to create Power Apps directly out of Microsoft Teams. So in Microsoft Teams, there's going to be a button that you will be able to click on and you are going to be able to create apps from data from that interface using um, data that's sitting inside your SharePoint environment already. This is just to, since as we are spending so much time in Teams nowadays, this is just bringing that interface closer for us to start creating more apps on the data that we are collecting. So I think this is going to be really nice to have and it's going to, to help improve and speed up, especially around those basic apps. For those of you who have created apps using apps from data, you know it's going to generate those couple of screens for us to be able to build that app off of the data that's in those lists and document libraries. So this is just going to help speed things up a lot. We are also bringing in additional capabilities and experiences in offline mode. Uh, we are making sure that model driven apps are faster and more reliable when they are working offline. We are also improving the error messages that are generated in offline mode. So you would be able to understand exactly what's going on when you are running into a problem. We are seeing more and more the requirement for these offline experiences, especially around first line workers. Uh, these people are usually operating in areas where they don't have strong connectivity or connectivity is just a problem. So we need to be able to make sure we are designing our apps to cater for these scenarios. And from a Microsoft perspective, we're adding a lot more capabilities and improving that experience. We are also bringing in the ability to leverage entities such as the currency entity to be able to be made available in offline mode and the barcode scanner control will also be available in offline mode moving forward as well so this actually started rolling out last month so a lot of these features you should start seeing coming into your tenants in the coming weeks we are also improving the imports or the solution import experience. So this is where you are taking solutions and you are moving them between environments, whether you own those environments or they separate tenants. This whole import experience is going to give you the ability to create and authorize the connections required by your flows um, so that when they are created, they are in a fully working state straight out off of the bat. You'll also be able to set environment variables where required. Um, we will be able to uh, reduce that complexity when we're busy choosing imports from actions. And there are a lot of additional accessibility features that are going to be added in this modern solution import experience as well. Another thing just for information's sake, we have 
launched our builder invoice processing automation starter kit onto AppSource. So think of this as the building block if you want to implement an invoice processing automation process inside your organization using the Power Platform. You can use the starter kit, which has the fundamentals of everything required to get going. So you've got a Power App, which is going to give you the ability to control and configure the entire solution. We're using the common data service to store the data. Uh, Power Automate is actually pulling the information from a mailbox and using the AI builder to process that data. So go and check it out on AppSource. It is available to use. Um, Justin, I see there's a question around Power App demo environment. There is the ability, if you want to set it up outside of your tenant, you can go and create a demo tenant with Microsoft 365. Uh, what I'll do is I'll share that link with you just now. Uh, it will take you, you can go sign up for a trial and you'll be able to test out inside there. Otherwise, within Power Apps, you can go and create temporary demo environments as well for CDS. And David, I see you are sending that. Perfect. Thanks. So, so this um, starter kit is quite useful. Play around with it. It can get you going. Now, just coming up, there is a virtual agents webinar happening this Friday, uh, 9 a.m. PST. At, I think it's 6 p.m. our time. But this is going to talk around all the new and exciting things coming out on Power Virtual Agents. So it's definitely worthwhile. There's some great speakers inside there. They're going to be touching on things like how to call Q&A Maker from Virtual Agents, how to set up Azure AD authentication, as well as how to leverage the Office Graph and how to pull information out of the Office Graph to get uh, access to users' information. Now, before we move on, is there anything else new that anyone has picked up? Anything else that you would like to share? Okay, and with that then, I'm going to hand over to Chris Baxter to take us through what they've been doing inside NetBank. Chris, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, just checking that uh, you've got my presentation up on the screen. Yes, looks clear. Can you hear you clearly? Perfect. So, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Baxter. Um, I, as as mentioned, I work in in uh, NetBank uh, in the CRB division, um, and I'm going to share with you tonight our journey in creating a business hub. Um, please understand, uh, I join you tonight not as a technocrat, but uh, as a business sponsor. So please don't expect uh, great technical prowess, but with any luck, I'll be able to share with you some of the wisdom that we gained along our journey to uh, building a successful business hub. Um, now, to start with, our team is uniquely positioned in that we sit within the business, uh, not within the technology function, and um, within my environment, we are responsible for both adoption and change management, as well as a business transformation lens. Um, this spans both uh, efficiency, value, uplift programs, and this in, in fact makes us perfectly suited for the task of realizing the value of um, the tool chain that we're talking about tonight. So let's get on with it. So really just to start by talking about the journey. So our journey started with understanding the capability. Um, we have, we we're lucky enough to have an Enterprise 5 license, um, and that was uh, quite an interesting insight for me. Um, and I really stumbled across this the day that I walked up to a Microsoft stand uh, on an open day because my initial intent was to ensure that I could expose our Azure services to our RPA uh, robotics team. Um, and after having a little bit of a chat, I established that we, in fact, had a Microsoft Digital Advisor um, within our environment, and, and this uh, is quite a key insight 
and played a, a pivotal role to the journey that we went on. Um, so thinking about this uh, and knowing that um, our te technical teams were deep in the trenches with foundational replacement programs and at the same time coming out of a business background and having a good insight into what the problems that statements that uh, are facing our businesses on a, on a daily basis, particularly around value acceleration and productivity were, and again, overlaying that um, with the robotics hat. Uh, we started by saying, well, or I started by saying, how do I find the appropriate people to execute on this. Um, and so we took a bit of a chance. Um, we uh, started with our robotics team and said, hey guys, um, you know, let's figure out what this does. So we went and very quickly uh, realized that we needed to understand what the office native product capabilities are and play these against the awareness. Um, because we certainly found quite quickly that what we had as evidence through my our own uh, lack of knowledge and what what we were aware of were two fundamentally different things. The collaboration tools were also new to us and the practical capabilities of the productivity suite were, were all fairly new. So as I said, we uh, engaged with our Microsoft uh, Digital Advisor and we started on a journey of uh, self-discovery and constantly uh, um, this gentleman was impressing upon me a particular slide. It's a Microsoft slide, and I'm going to share with uh, share it with you uh, shortly. Um, and credit to Microsoft on that slide. It was quite interesting that every time uh, he impressed upon me the three tiers of personal productivity, team productivity, and then the power platform. Um, I like typical um, ADHD businessman jumped straight to this is the power platform. How are we going to use it? And where are we going to leverage it? And, uh, you, you know, once um, once I, I fell on this um, a few times, I realized that uh, having developed my personal pitch presentation, which was really around my understanding at the time being low code, flex governance, risk model, um, we started looking at roles and responsibilities. As we came into roles and responsibilities, we really realized that very quickly uh, pertinent to understand who in our organization would be the platform provider, who in fact would be the business hub, um, and who and where are those guardrails, i.e. where is the professional development. Um, and, and that really led to some, some very interesting debate internally. Um, and uh, armed with the humility of having gotten understanding the capability incorrect, uh, I was now paying a lot more attention and and thankfully um, having sat down with with our CIO and our digital advisor and and fleshing out some ideas we got to a point where we defined a model um, and in that model we were very clear around who owns the platform what does that ownership mean who uses the platform what does that mean and really what are the core competencies and capabilities that we we are looking for and why are we looking to use this platform into the value gap um, and really uh, having taken a few few trips to to exco and facing um, and faced a few questions uh, from our exco on what we had presented uh, the use cases and the capabilities that we presented it became pretty clear that the value gap was that we now had access uh, in this particular instance to a low lower code uh, capability that could be used elsewhere. But very quickly, we also got to the the cloud journey being part of the value gap and cloud integration value statements started to play a larger and larger um, part of our explanations and, and our journey maps. Um, and certainly, as you can imagine, within a, within a larger organization, some repeat conversations around what is business innovation versus what are IT projects um, and, and that's probably something that as a community we can discuss ad nauseum. We found a happy medium uh, um, and we found a happy medium through those guardrails and also through bumping our heads a few times. Having established that we move 
moved into value realization and, and this was quite key. Um, whilst the prototypes that we had managed to push out were really cool, what we needed to do was to land a few lighthouse projects to show real value and having done that people sat up and took um, a, a fair amount of interest and and they really listened to what the value proposition was that we could service um, so so post those um, post those realizations we then started to talk about skills transfer because who was going to do this and as I said we'd started within business we started this uh, within um, our uh, team who are, who are multi uh, skilled and I tell you what we couldn't have done it without the people. So in our hub, one of the largest uh, and most profound learnings that we had are around people. We took citizen developers, not necessarily IT developers. We've taken a blend of, uh, of skill, but the one common thread is logical application experience. Be that application experience uh, gained um, in business uh, or uh, from um, some some theoretical learnings such as in an engineering degree or mathematics degree and in fact um, some of our team are, are in fact IT um, professionals as well but they are in the minority and certainly not uh, the majority because looking at that value proposition of available lower code business solving business problems for themselves um, we then went on this journey and, and really as I said uh, very fortunate to have the team that we do, um, who are encouraged by the challenge. Now, another, as I mentioned earlier, the adoption and change management team sits in my space. And we already had a very um, interesting, and, and when I explain it to you, a quite simple and logical um, experiment running in our world, it came about as a result of some efficiency um, plays. So in traditional waterfall project management, you have multiple uh, role players and you have multiple handoffs having just moved into um, into an agile world and being under some some serious scrutiny to, to control costs um, we were finding our feet as, an, as a team within the organization and uh, we took a, a, a chance and said well let's introduce this concept of vertical integration and vertical integration I suppose lines up quite nicely with DevOps but effectively, as opposed to having a project manager, business analyst, process engineer, developer, tester, release manager, and support personnel within the life cycle of your project, um, we found that it worked well to use members on much larger projects of the same team to either fill a role, or if the project was a smaller project, such as we typically see within this space, then give the team the opportunity opportunity to own this. Let them own it from cradle to grave and let them impress upon us and, and build on their own strengths um, and, and core skills. And we found this to be really nicely combinatorial within the within the team. Um, and I must say, this has worked really well. One of the biggest discussion points that we had with our Microsoft Digital Advisor and of course our CIO was the traditional model and those uh, models exhibited by similar players that we had now gone and visited to try and understand their model and their success factors was to build independent solution enablement teams and business solution teams. Um, the solution enablement team core focus on uh, extending the worldview and bringing on more participants and players and business solutions to look after the more difficult solutions or to to always uh, pick on our compliance attorneys but to assist departments such as our uh, regulatory compliance lawyers um, they're really not too interested in anything outside of of legalese and so we needed to be in a place where as a business we could support our own business internally and why did we do this well as i mentioned previously we do have um our technology folk really busy on making some core foundational changes within the organization and it's best that we we free them up to do that um, it's a great 
efficiency and capacity play um, that, that we solve as business, problems that we can solve, and it enable them to go and focus on those core technology solutions. Um, yes, so the final step of this was that we found quite quickly, and it was a learning that we'd had as a team from other environments that we could automate processes as they existed and we could expect a particular outcome. Or if we got the trust of that business partner, we could in fact automate the process and within that automation um, arena or digitization arena, we could also include some process re-engineering. And as we've built a rapport with business, they've allowed a more and more latitude for the team to do this and this is is absolutely critical um, and we found that whilst we can repeat processes that exist today that is fundamentally flawed because it is based on the assumption that the process today is designed based on today's software and in fact it's been my experience that often processes that are working and are based on the available technology at the time that they were defined are left alone um, unless it breaks, I don't think many people have the, the time or resource to go and fix it. Um, and so to assume that any process that we've been asked to look at um, as being uh, optimal, uh, perhaps could, could use a little bit of, of kicking the tires. Slide, um, and again, credit to, to Microsoft and the Digital Advisory Service that I really needed to understand. And this is what I missed in the first part of our journey in understanding the capability. I missed the fact that building this business was as much about personal productivity and team productivity and collaboration as it was about introducing the new tools of the productivity and innovation or power platforms. And really, once I got my head around understanding that as we as we increase or maximize the personal productivity of individuals, and we then maximize the productivity of teams and collaboration amongst teams, we then position our, ourselves in a place to innovate. Um, and, and that really, you know, starts to resonate a little bit late, would have made the journey a whole lot easier had I caught this earlier. Um, but to Microsoft's credit, they, they did go blue in the face trying to explain this. I was overly focused on the power platform and almost missed it. So in moving between adopting and change management into the digital advisory service. Um, that for us was a huge learning and it certainly helped to shape the ultimate end goal. And if we look at what we now have defined, um, again, this is a co-created slide, we have defined um, multiple roles within this environment. As I said up front, um, somebody needs to own that platform. As a business unit, we don't own that platform and nor do we seek to own that platform. We have specialists in our environment that do that. What we what we do seek to play a part in is creating a community of practice. That community of practice's role is then from a business unit hub or cluster COE, I really dislike COE um, and, and hence the use of the word hub all the time, um, to, to go out and actively engage, to nurture the interest um, and, and foster that uh, and growth to then promote the tool chain is really the uh, the large value proposition that we within business have as we have that business understanding of the context and we we then um, overlay that with the understanding of the, the tool chain and the realization of of the capabilities and what you can see here is a business enablement team focused on teaching citizen development, focusing on teaching the business community self-enablement, and a business support team focused on a far smaller number of individuals playing that build on behalf of business phase. Now, as I said in the previous slide, the one thing where we sort of shocked um, a lot of our, our uh, key critical stakeholders was we chose to use this one team to do both. 
um, and, and that's rather unconventional. Why did we choose that? Well, because we wanted to keep uh, our developers and, and our um, team further engaged and we wanted to continue to broaden their skill set. And if we split the team, then we had we ran the risk of potentially having guys going out and building proof of concepts with businesses and then handing them over to a business support team um, who then probably end up rewriting them anyway if they need to support them because they'd like to see it in their own um, confines of, of logic and, um, and methodologies. And finally, as I mentioned before, uh, very important to acknowledge where this tool chain is not the appropriate solution. Um, and, and that, as you can imagine, is quite an interesting uh, internal and fairly robust uh, debate. And, and it was nice to go around the houses with that particular piece of work because it certainly gave us a lot of um, insights from additional role players within the environment. Um, and, and what that uh, sort of highlighted was where those guardrails exist and where in fact as a business hub, we need to say, hold on, we have now either gone too far into integration or we've started to touch our technology team's environment of foundational capabilities and programs, etc. And actually, this would be better suited, supported out of a professional development space. Um, and, and really, that was, that was growth and learning. Again, to my arrogance, this picture did start without that. Um, and, and certainly it's it's a it's a well understood and and well appreciated model um, at this point. So I just want to add the last uh, the last slide that I have to share with you this evening, and this is really around not the business development piece, but the business enablement piece. So as I said, there, there were a few things that that didn't um, naturally gravitate into my rather competitive business head. Um, and when these landed, um, these were really golden for us. And we've seen the benefits. We've seen how when we start um, and on the on the far right hand side, this rather green team is uh, our business hub. And you can see that 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 icon is larger. We're really in, incredibly involved up front. And what we're doing in that first phase of our business engagement is awareness, conducting immersions, ensuring that business understand what the art of the possible is, explaining the paradigm shifts. I can't stress enough where we where we managed to win over um, our business stakeholders by explaining what Microsoft was, even when people felt that they knew it very well because they'd been using Word as a word processor for the last, I don't know, 22 years years. I still remember when it was, uh, you know, when Excel was Lotus. Uh, maybe I'm giving my age away. But understanding that whilst we still have a word process, as we move into the cloud, we have some other things as well. And that that's really been a key critical component um, of our journey. Following that, we move into a business workshop and we take business along with us on, on these uh, journeys. And, and the point here is to enable the business. So, as we start to unpack the problem with the business, we do this in a tooling agnostic manner. Uh, we start to identify the digital hotspots, and to do this, we use the things like design thinking, um, start to alleviate teaching problems, and we then do uh, a co-created MVP. As this starts to, as this bug then starts to bite within our business uh, community colleagues, you'll see that we, as as a hub, are able to step back back a little bit and and start to play more of a supporting role as those uh, colleagues now start to take on the learnings that that we've passed the paradigm shifts and and their excitement around the platform and they then start to solve their own problems um, and we whilst we've successfully as a business unit landed a number of, of lighthouse um, uh, projects we have also managed to pass that knowledge on uh, into our business unit and that is now yielding results where businesses you know and I'm not talking IT professionals I'm talking accountants um, in some cases quants 
uh, in some cases, a couple of cases, engineers are picking up the tool chain and saying, okay, this is not necessarily my, my calling in life, but I would far rather solve a business problem within my own environment, and I would choose to own that, than make this into a large waterfall project or agile costly project, and let's see what I can do myself. In some cases, this is really just driven in a because um, what we've managed to get to at the end of uh, of that that program was an, a proof of concept that worked from an innovation project, and those have then gone on and turned into IT type projects. Um, and those individuals are encouraged uh, to see this through to the end, so they're encouraged to join the project team and to continue on. Um, and really, and that's uh, I think that's my twenty minutes. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity opportunity to chat to you uh, this evening and uh, thank you for listening to our story um, and we certainly look forward to coming back to uh, the Josie Pug um, and sharing some of the common capabilities that we've managed to build as um, citizen developers uh, rather than pro -dev developers. Thanks Chris, that is really awesome. Uh, are there any uh, questions for Chris? Uh, yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes, Ramli. How are you? Chris, that was great work. Um, I'm from Sasol and uh, we you. just started on the journey. In fact, I uh, think the first week of June, uh, we're going to have our first hackathon. Uh, we're looking forward to it. And I'm excited that you are embracing uh, DevOps um, especially the tool chain from a governance standpoint. Um, I've got a few questions for you. Um, so maybe just uh, starting with one. So you said, uh, who owns the platform? I, I, is it is it the business or is the IT? Maybe if you can just uh, uh, give us a view there. So IT owns the platform. Um, platform ownership, ITSM, control governance functions, those are IT functions. All right. So I don't, uh, I don't yeah. seek to, um, but but I certainly do feel um, that the journey we went on enabled us to have some influence. So, as a business, there's there's generally a, a fairly healthy. Um, I'm trying to put this politely. A conversation between IT and business, um, and and I think we found. Um, a mutually agreeable approach um, and, and that really came around particularly with um, that got that set of guardrails and actually when I, I believe that the, this went really well when I called up uh, my colleagues in, in IT and said listen I've got a business they have asked us to do the following and I know that this is beyond what we should be doing so please here we go, I'm setting up the meeting, attend, and, and let's address this properly. And that really went a long way from a relationship standpoint to make sure that we had the correct design in terms of governance. Chris, uh, thanks for that. Maybe uh, the second question on that is um, the support model. Um, I'm a citizen developer. I build an app. Uh, IT owns the platform. Uh, how does the support model work? So what we've defined um, is two types of, of support. And, and let me just uh, let me get this uh, presentation up again. I um, just want to share this with you. So, so this is quite a, a complex uh, slide. I use it to confuse the daylights out of everyone. Um, let's see if I can get straight to the slide. Sorry, let's jump here. So what you'll see here on my screen is you've got business self-enablement. So these little green monkeys here in the business community, this is business building solutions for themselves. Now, if business build the solution for themselves, they manage and support and maintain their app. However, we're not going to leave them alone. We, we've established ourselves as a hub, um, as a support service. So if if one of the citizen developers in a business line needs assistance, he calls up my transformation lead and he says, hey man, 
I'm experiencing this problem, you know, could I get a bit of help? And the answer is always yes. It's not about yes or no, it's about when. So be because that ownership and that risk sits with the business, we're happy to help them out. When we get to the, the hub building, on behalf of business, we then again have a split model because if the hub builds this on behalf of business, understand we, we're a small team and we wish to remain loose and agile, so we would far rather pass this back to business and let business be the master of their own destiny. And, and if we're successful in that, then first-line business support is done by that business owner. There is another piece of the model that says, okay, hold on, I'm a regulatory attorney. Attorney, I couldn't give a, a you know two two dons about how this process works, and in that case, we have a support model where, in fact, it is uh, built and run by the hub. Uh, and similarly, when the when our hub start to touch ProDev environment, we can build in the hub and pass to the Pro ITSM um, or, or IT team, and vice versa. Um, that is. That's a slightly more fluid model, and that's one of the things that we're depicting in this um, in this image that we've got up on screen. Brilliant, Chris. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I just want to maybe add to that. And what I really like about the, the NetBank CIB story is that nobody understands the business requirement better than business. And it really just enables them to, to create the solutions without having to translate it to, to business analysts and developers and all of these sort of things. So they can really jump into it and, and get it done. Um, and the second thing is a lot of these, um, like Chris mentioned, is, is a lot of these solutions won't necessarily have a priority with the, the pro dev teams. Um, for funding and all of these sort of things, so so these solutions probably wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the for the business up. So, so I think those two combined is is just amazingly powerful. Awesome presentation, thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Really thank appreciate you. your time having. and thank you for sharing. And I'm thanks, sure we'll Linda. have you back on again soon. Okay, next up. David, I'm going to hand the mark over to you. Thanks, man. So, quickly share my screen. And uh, while we're waiting for that, so in the previous meetup, we introduced the uh, Canvas app pop-up component. Now, I don't know if you have had time to play around with it yet. Uh, so far, the feedback we've been getting on this is, is really exciting and phenomenal. Um, so we've also released a, a video on how to get up and running with this component within a very short space of time. But one of the questions that we got asked, uh, we get asked quite often is, how do you update it? So if there's a new version of this thing released, how do you make sure that you always have access to the latest version of this? So what we're going to do today is to show you how to install this component using component, component libraries. Um, and if you haven't played around with component libraries, I'd really recommend that you do so. Uh, they really just make your life a lot easier you know, going forward, especially if there's new versions of components that are being released. Instead of having to install these things from scratch, you can go into the app and literally just update it with the latest functionality. Right, so what I'm going to show you now is um, how to get access to the component, how to install it into a component library, how to incorporate that into an application, and then also how to update that to the later version of that component. All right, so we're going to go to aka.ms forward slash power apps dash pop up. And this is where you can find uh, the component in the community gallery. Um, so there's a, a lot of reading. You don't have to be intimidated by this. Just at the top, you can click here to watch a video to get up and running with it in, in five minutes. Um, and then right at the bottom, there are all the instructions and how all of this works and how it's wired together. Um, right at the bottom, you'll see that there are three files. The first one is a thumbnail, which is obviously not going to help you much. The second one is an application that has the component in it as well. So 
it's a demo app that has the component in it and it's then very easy to play around with the pop-up to see what are the different messages that you can throw onto the screen and what are the different uh, responses that you get back from the pop-up and how to then use these responses. And then the third file is the component alone. So that, that's not housed in the demo app. Uh, so if you're really familiar with component libraries, you can just go ahead and download this third file, import that into your library, and you're good to go. All right, so for the rest of us, uh, we can go to the model dialog demo file, and you can simply just download that. You'll see the current version is 013, so it's, it's still in public preview. So if there's any bugs or, or any of that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's very possible that there might be small little glitches in it. Um, so we're working hard to make sure that all of these little nigglies are sorted out, uh, but please don't let that deter you. Uh, please go ahead and, and play with it. All right, so there you'll go and download this, and then you'll go into your Power Apps environment, and you'll see, if you haven't noticed this before, if you go to the Apps uh, navigation on the left, you'll see that there's a tab called Components Library. And just like the pop-up, this is also still in preview, although it's, it's fairly, it's very stable. We haven't had much issues with it um, recently. So we're going to go into the component libraries, um, and this is where we're going to create a library of all of these different components and then import them into the apps as we need them. Right, so for this demo, I'm going to show you how to import the demo app, then create the component library using the component in the demo app, and then also explain why that might be a good idea. So at the top where it says import canvas app, we're going to import that entire application that we downloaded, although we're going to import version 11 and not 13. 13 is the latest. We're going to import 11 so that I can easily show you the differences between those two versions in, in the fixes that we applied in them. All right, so I'm going to import the entire demo app, and the reason for that is you might want to play around with a new version of the component, uh, understand what the changes are, and understand how it might affect your apps in your production environment or in your, your live environments uh, before you actually affect this into your, your uh, component libraries. So like I'm going to do now, I'm going to create this app with the version V011 included in the demo app name. So I'm going to click on Create New, and I'm going to say this is V011. So this is now going to create the Canvas app into the environment. I'm going to import that. usually takes a second or two, or if you're in a demo, it takes a second or eight. Okay, there you go. So the entire app has is, is been imported. And if you now click on apps, you'll see there is the app. And if you launch this, it's now going to give you the opportunity to play around with this component to see how it works um, and actually get some responses back from it as well. So if you haven't Try this out, please go to aka.ms forward slash power apps dash pop up. So we're going to allow the Office 365 connector and we're going to jump into the demo screen. So there are, these are combinations of all of the different pop ups that you can do. So there's just a normal OK, and that might uh, go up to Office 365 users where you have a lookup, a gal lookup. And this is the functionality that we're going to be testing now. Right, so for, for this, I'm just going to close this app. Um, and now we're going to go and create the component library. And this is where we're now going to actually house the component and then surface that to all of the other apps in their environment. So if we go to comp uh, components library, you see nothing has been pre-baked, so I can uh, go and create a new one. And you can decide if you want to bundle multiple components into one component library. Um, it might be a good idea for certain like uh, generic app components. So if you have headers and pop-ups and all of these sort of things that are very much similar and you typically bundle them together based on the functionality. So let's just say this is going to be generic app components. And if you create this library, you'll notice that it looks like a normal Power App, and it's because it is there's uh, very little difference between a component library and an actual Power App. 
The only difference is you, you can't dynamically link components between apps. You can import them, but once you've imported them, it breaks the inheritance. So then if you update that in the source app, uh, it won't automatically update the destination, which with uh, component libraries, it will automatically take care of that. So what we're going to do is click on the three ellipses over here and import the components. And you'll see it's one of the options it now gives me is to import components from other applications in in this environment. And here is the V11 or V011 um, application that we just imported. So I'm going to tell it that I want to import the components from this file or from this application. Again, it's going to ask me to trust the Office 365 users, which I want to do. Right, and now you'll see that there's component one. This is the default that comes with the new component library. So we can typically go ahead and delete that. And here is the actual component that we're looking for. Right, so at this stage, um, I'm just going to keep it simple. So I'm not going to um, do anything else with this. I'm just going to go and file, uh, save. I'm going to save it to the environment, to the cloud. And because this is the first version, it will automatically publish this component library as well. Um, where if you change it, you need to go and publish it as well before it will be available or the new version would be available to all the apps that use this library. Right, so if we ref refresh this screen, we'll see the component library sitting over there. And you'll see that it's got a little icon that shows you the books in the library. So that's how you can differentiate between libraries and apps. So now I'm going to go back into apps where I can still see the demo app that we downloaded, but I'm not now going to create a new app and pretend to be, which is going to be the app, the end user app that we now actually want to consume the pop-up into. And, you know, that's the, the app that could be an existing application as well that you now want to make use of the dynamic or the generic uh, pop-up functionality rather instead of creating your own. I'm going to create a new Canvas app. Let's use a tablet layout. Okay, and there we go. It's loaded brand new Canvas. So the first instinct might be to click on components within this app in order to create the or import the component. And you can do that, but the problem is that it won't make use of the library. So if I go and say import components, you'll see that it shows me the same screen that allows me to import that component from the demo app that I imported. But that's not what I want to do because after the import, it will break the inheritance. There would be no inheritance. And then if I update the component in, in future, it won't automatically update all the apps. So what you need to do is on the left-hand side, click on the plus or the insert icon. And then at the bottom, click on get more components. And that'll list all of the component libraries that you have created in this environment. So over here, you'll see there's the generic app components, component library that we created. And that's got the CMP modal dialog component inside of it. So if we're now going to import that, you'll see that it now makes it available in this list of controls. And I can then go and say, I want to add under library components, I want to add the modal dialog to the active screen. And if you now go in, you'll see that there it sits, right? So at the moment, it's not doing anything because we haven't wired it yet, and it's taking up um, only a portion of the screen. Some of the later versions, you don't have to go and set the width and the height. Uh, but for this version 11, we still needed to go and set this to parent or height and then the width to parent dot width. All right, so that fills the screen. Now, next, what do we need to do uh, just to activate this component? If we go back into the instructions, You'll, you'll also notice that there are two sets of instructions. If you don't choose to watch the video, um, there are instructions to follow if you want to use the component library. 
and then there are instructions to use without the component library. So the first set of instructions is without using the component library, and then underneath that is using with the component library. All right, so all that we need to do now is we want to set the, we want to create a toggle. And the toggle, like we discussed last time, is what is responsible for actioning any responses that comes back from the pop-up. So we're just going to copy that into my new app, and then I'm going to insert a toggle. Toggles are hugely uh, powerful things for centralizing uh, functionality or, or code. So uh, that's going to be on the right place now. So that's the toggle default. So we're going to go to the default property, and we're going to paste that in there. Then we're going to go back to the instructions and get the on check functionality. Then we're also going to put into the toggle, and this is what actually tells the toggle what to do when it gets a response back from the pop-up. And then we're going to create a button, and then in the button we're just going to put this formula just as a demonstration on how the pop-up actually works. Okay, so insert button. Let's put that over there. And then we should be good to go. Just one last thing we need to do is just on the, the toggle, it's also in the instructions and the documentation. We just need to change the false, which basically disables the toggle to this formula. And this will actually make a trigger as soon as there's something in this uh, dialogue responses collection. So at this stage, we want to save this app. So let's just say this is my temp uh, demo app. We want to save this to the cloud and then just restart this. So in the last demo, when we tried to find the new app that we save, we couldn't find it. Uh, well, that bug's been fixed. So if we close this now, I know that we will be able to find it. Okay, so if we go to open, there's our temp demo app. Thank you, Microsoft, for sorting that out. And now you'll see on the screen that there's the component, but it's not showing. And if we now go in and click on the button, you'll see there's our brand new component that has been installed and it's working well. So if we click on OK, um, that'll go away. Any questions so far? All good. Right, so next I want to show you the piece of functionality that we enhanced between version 11 and version 12. Oh, sorry, uh, version 11 and 12, and which is by application also in 13. Um, and then we're going to go and actually update the, the, um, the component. Right, so we want to change this normal pop-up to be an Office 365 users pop-up. So I'm just going to change um, the type to uh, input, and then the input type is, actually I don't need all of that, just not Office 365 users. All of this is in the documentation, but now it's basically going to give me a prompt uh, that's going to ask me for a username. So if I test this now, going to ask me for a, a username, and this is going to give me the Office 365 uh, gal um, as, a, as a lookup list. Now, the fix in the component between version 11 and 12 was if you typed MOD, so you'll see this MOD administrator, you'll see that that finds the MOD administrator perfect. If you type admin, it also finds the, the person without an issue, but if I typed admin at, it didn't, and the re it, it now doesn't find the person. And the reason for that is this control didn't search the UPN um, for uh, for the search term as well. So that's something that we, we fixed in, in version 12. And uh, like you see, the component that we just imported, it's not working because it's on version 11. So what we're going to do now is close this app. 
go and update the latest version in the components library and then see how that automatically now updates into the, the, the apps that the users are consuming. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to close the component library as well. And I'm going to go back into the apps and I'm now going to import the demo app. Like I said earlier, if you're familiar with uh, component libraries, you can just download the component and then just do that straight. Uh, you don't have to do the demo app, but um, you might also want to keep a version of all of the historic versions of the component. If for whatever reason you want to roll back or go and check how something worked in the previous version, um, then you know that'll that'll help you as well. Right, so we're going to say this is V013. And now after that's imported, we can now go and update the component library and make that available. And that'll then automatically um, make it available to all of the apps that are using that environment or that component library. And that's extremely useful if you have 100 apps using the same pop-up it's almost impossible to go back and just manually update all of the different uh, controls in these apps. You know, so the component libraries really make it a lot easier for you. So if I go into the component libraries, you'll see that there's my a component library that I created earlier. I can right click on that and click on edit. And that allows me to go and import the components from either the local files on my machine, which I, which I down, could have downloaded, or directly from other apps again. Okay, so all of that's looking good. I can I go and say import components and you'll see it's clever enough to show or to understand that that component is already imported. It just checks the name and then it's going to tell me that's going to update this component. Are you sure you want to do that? So in this list, it shows me the demo app for version 11. This is the previous version and there's a version 13, which is the latest version. So I'm going to import 13 going to pick up that there's already that component is already in the, the component library and it's going to ask me if I want to replace it and in this case I do want to replace it. Okay so all of that's working well I can go file save just on that point sorry we'd asked me for a comment there which would have been good practice to just type into that comment what it changed because you might have multiple app makers that are now going to be notified that there's a new version of the components available and uh, that they need to go and update the app. So it's a good idea to tell them what actually changed. But there I've published it. And if I now close the components library and go back into my temp demo app. So this is the app that's not consuming the, the component. Or one of the apps that might be consuming it. You'll see the moment I open this in the in this design studio, it tells me that there is component library updates available. Um, it already it picks that up and that'll do it for all of the 100 or 200 apps that are now making use of the centralized component library. So I can go and say I want to review the changes. And if I added any comments, it would have showed me what these, these changes are. So it tells me that the generic app components have changed and you can then go and say an update. And that's also very why it's important to group components that are similar in, in, in application together because it's now going to update all of them. So if I bundled a new header or a new footer or a new menu structure into that same library, it would have now updated all of those components into the current app. So if we now go in, I click on this button and Go and look for MOD, we see that's still working fine. If you go and look for admin, you'll see that's finding admin because of the surname of the MOD administrator. But if I type admin at, you'll see that it still finds um, this person because of the fact that it's also now looking at the UPN or the user principal name uh, from the, office or the Azure um, AD directory. So this is now the new component updated. I don't have to go and apply any of the other logic, so I don't have to uh, go and set the screen widths. Or if I change the theme of the component, I don't have to update any of those things. Um, all of that just stays exactly the same. Um, it just updated the, the component application structure. So do we have any questions?
that was awesome, David. Thanks. Right, Are there so any other the... questions at the moment? No, I'll take that as you did a good job presenting it because you were clear and concise. There's no questions. David, Tiana, so yeah. Um, when you imported the, the version 13 and you showed it in the list there, um, except for knowing which one is 11 and 13, you couldn't distinguish it from the names. Would it maybe make sense to change your convention to include the version in the front or somewhere, or can you extend that list to see which one you're picking? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so what you could do, you could definitely change your naming convention when you import them. Um, or what you could do, just open up that component library. If you if you hover over those names, then it actually shows you the full the full name. Um, it's not that obvious, um, but but that is an option. I don't think you can expand the column. I haven't been able to get that right. So if we're going to say import component, you're talking about this view over here, right? Yep. So if I hover over this, it'll show me that that is V013 and that's V011. So that's a, that's a very good point. We can actually shorten this name and then, you know, or add the, the version in front of it when you import it. All right, cool. Thanks. Any other questions? So just on this topic as well, I think it's uh, the, the upgrade that we just did now is extremely easy to do. And whether you have 100 or 200 apps, it would be very simple to do that. Um, and I think that's a good case for, for trying not to modify the component. So if you had any manual modifications to the component, because it's open source, you can obviously go and do that. Um, but then if there's new versions of this thing being released, you know, it's going to be a lot harder to update it into, into the different apps if you go and customize these things. So we really encourage everybody to, if you have suggestions on how to make this component better, uh, please let us know so we can add it to the, the, the wish list and then include that in future versions so that it makes it better for everybody in the community. And I think that's that's really the idea for, for these pop-ups is so that everybody can benef benefit from these things. So if you have any suggestions, please please let us know so we can uh, we can build them in. Awesome stuff. Thanks, David. Really appreciate that. Okay, and with that, we're going to hand it over to Michael for Michael's Cookbook. Do you just want to explain to us what Michael's Cookbook is all about? You're still on mute. Um, I am on mute. Uh, all, all, all the designed on purpose. Uh, so, so Mike's. What, what do you call the segment? Mike's cookbook. Yeah. Or Mike's silly questions. Can... Yeah, something like <laughs> those lines. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, this is just uh, um, in. Often, when we ask for questions, there's silence. Uh, so I always will prepare a few questions based on some of my experiences in building apps uh, and some of the struggles that I've come across or questions that I've I've needed to go and research. So that's, that's what the segment is about. And to try and stump uh, David, who, who just seems to know uh, the answers to all my questions. So that's what the segment is. Um, cool. So oh, I have, yeah, yeah, sorry, carry on. Uh, no, I'm, not I'm not sure if that should be the objective of the session, but okay. <laughs> okay, and um, I, I must just also start by saying that um, the three previous um, presenters, uh, honestly, I, I can't tell the difference between the three of you. you. You you all look exactly the same. Are you triplets? I feel a bit left out. I've got hair I shouldn't have. Um, so I've got to work on that. Uh, uh, maybe I'm just jealous. Eh? OK, uh, can you see my desktop? Is that a well, question? We yes, see yes, the we can. PowerPoint presentation. Now your hair's in the way. <laughs> <laughs> funny, funny, funny. OK, cool. So uh, I've got three questions today. Um, and my first question is, um, when should I use uh, set 
versus update context. Um, to me, they look pretty much the same. You know, I want to save a value and a variable so I can use it somewhere else. Um, and I do this often. Um, I've always used set. I've never used update context. So I was wondering, when should I use update context? And I'm hoping yeah. Donovan's going to answer this. Oh, is, it, is that for me? That's for you. <laughs> if, if, if there's anybody else in the call that wants to answer this, you're more than welcome as well. So, so, so basically, the, the show, let me get an app going, and, uh, and I can show you the differences between the two. Okay, so I'm just going to create a, a brand new application. All right, so, so let's start with uh, the set function. And I think uh, set is, is very widely used. So, so let's start with that. Um, so, so both of these set as well as update context um, are used for storing variables, right? So that makes makes it easier to, to write logic once, and then you can reuse the answers or the, the values as a result of these this logic um, in all of your app. So a good example is something like uh, your user profile. So if we go to on start, so typically we'll go and say set var user profile to the entire user object that we get back. Right, so if I go and run the app on start, and I go to view variables, you'll see there's a, a global uh, selection at the top. And then we've got the var user profile variable. And if you open that up, um, you'll see that there's a it's a record. And then it's got your picture, it's got your full name and your email address. Um, all of that's stored. And then it's very easy to use that throughout the application. So if you now want to grab your image, you, you can very easily do that without generating network traffic or anything like that because it's already stored in this variable. Now, this is this will work on multiple screens. So if I go to insert new screen and I go into screen one and I add a label to say show me the var user profile dot uh, full name, you'll see that that gives me an answer. If I take that exact same label and I put it on screen two, that variable is going to be available to that screen as well. Um, and hence the little hint, if you go to view variables at the top, it says it's a global variable. So set is used for global variables. Then update context is only relevant to the, the screen on which it's being set. So if I go and add a button, to screen one, and I go and say update context. Um, also, update context, you need to pass, pass it the value as a record uh, because it's uh, it actually stores all of the screen variables in one record. So I can go and say, um, let's say as, a, as an example, um, username is Mike. And if I run this on screen one, and I go to view my variables, you'll see that there's now another option for under global, and that's now for screen one. And that'll show me the username is Mike, but that's only available on screen one. So if I go and add another label, and I go and say, show me the username, you'll see that it shows me the value on screen one, but if I copy that to screen two, it's not going to have a, val a value uh, because I didn't set that context variable for this screen. All right, so that's the difference between set update context, um, but there's actually a third one as well that you could use in context of a formula itself, and that is called with. So if I go and say um, with pass it a record, and then I can go and say name, is Joe. I can then write a formula um, underneath it was a second parameter for the with function and then use these parameters that's only available in the context of this formula. 
So if I go and say hi um, and ampersand name. Okay, so why? Oh, I didn't close the record. Sorry. Okay, so if I go and say hi name, you'll see that that is not going to say hi Joe. Um, and this is this is the third type of variable that you could use that's only relevant to to the actual formula in which you're using it. Okay, so does that make sense? Cool, cool, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, and there was an extra tip and learning there, which was, you know, if you're going to be calling uh, data, for example, the users uh, um, function, um, don't call it on every screen, rather. And you know, kind of call it on app start or screen one visible or whatever it is, save it in a variable and then just reuse that variable in the rest of the application so you don't generate additional requests to the data. Perfect. Cool beans. Thank you. Okay, so question number two. Sounds like a you know game show. Question number two. Actually, this one. I am um, it's easier for me to actually show. So let's jump here to this app. Uh, my screen coming through, right? Yes, perfect. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, is basically a, a problem that I always have is, uh, you know, I'm de designing this, um, you know, this amazing user experience. It's got lots of um, fields or labels, controls on, on the screen. And I struggle to align them. It's just such a pain, man. Um, I'll, so on the right hand side, yeah, I, I put on a label called full name, and then I put it there, and then, you know, I put this other label on over here, and I set it to a value. You'll see it actually is getting it from um, this variable, actually this collection called selected uh, customer, and I'm getting the full name, and then I want an email, and then I want the customer's actual email, which is email address one. You know, and I, and I struggle to actually align all these things and to give them the equal spacing underneath each other um, and the same font for all of them and the same font size. And this just drives me mad. And I keep also like bumping the mouse and then the control moves again, you know, two days later. And I'm like, wow, the controls all moved. Um, so I thought of a few different options and, and David's helped uh, um, on this before, uh, one of them is what you do is you you take the you know your initial label um, and you place it where you want it, and then the rest of the controls you set um, their x and y coordinates uh, in reference to the first one. So, for example, email here, I can go and set um, uh, the x coordinate equal to well, I need to know this control's name. LBL full name seven. Oh, shocker! Um, so I can make this LBL full name. What was it? Seven, right? Dot x. So now, as I move this around, you'll see the one underneath also moves. But actually, what I should really do is align these texts to the left and then it'll look better. So, wow, isn't that amazing? Uh, which is kind of okay, it kind of works, but it gets also very complicated um, uh, quite quickly when you have something like on the left-hand side over here. So what I've done on the left-hand side over here is I've used a gallery control. I've fallen in love with gallery controls. They're the answer, in my opinion, to everything. Um, so when in doubt, you use a gallery control. And so with the gallery control, if I look at this gallery control here, that's displaying um, field names and values all aligned perfectly, all with the same font, the same um, italics, color, et cetera. Uh, in here, there's actually only two controls, um, the label on the left and the label on the right. And everything else is just repeating under it because it's a gallery control. Uh, and so it just repeats essentially your row multiple times. So I only have to get the first two right and then everything else will just follow those patterns. And so essentially what I've done here is I've taken the data that was going to be bound into these controls and I've loaded it into a collection uh, and then bound that collection to this gallery control. So you'll see here the gallery control 
is actually bound to this collection called uh, collection user profile. Uh, and in here, you'll actually see the data. So date of birth, email address, and the value, et cetera. Um, now, David actually gave me another tip. He said, I actually shouldn't do this type of thing here. It would say, not that I shouldn't do it, but when someone else opens this app and they look at call user profile, they're like, well, what is that? Where was it set? And then they have to go hunting around. Was that set on the first screen or on app on start? So um, actually, if you can, try and you know do the conversion uh, of your data into your table or your collection whatever like in line if that makes sense so just to give you an idea what what we mean by that is let me take this sample um, here so this is what i'm going to put in so essentially i'm going to say okay i've got a table um, and this table um, is has got three rows if you want to call it that um, and there's a name and there's a value field for each one. So the first one will say date of birth is the name. The second one will say email is the name and the third one will be telephone. And then the values are a date, uh, email address, and then uh, a value here. So let me just copy this and rather put that in there. So there's now my table and there we go. So there it is all aligned perfectly and if i change this label narrower wider you know everything underneath the changes um, so just so much easier to work with the gallery control uh, and then if i just have to be um, you know more complete obviously i'm hard coding everything here so that's not uh, the real data here's a, you know, a more detailed version of what i was doing where i was getting the selected customer's birthday the selected customer's email address, the selected customer's mobile number, ID number, et cetera. And also some of them I wanted to format the birth date as a date uh, and do some additional stuff on it. So what I could rather go and do is now put this as the items collection. And there we go. There I've got my data all nicely structured always in line and dare I say looking beautiful maybe that is awesome that is awesome Mark. bold amen it's just a much better way of doing it obviously if I if I'm only going to show this once then you know doing it in line like I did here with setting the data is a good idea but if I'm going to have some like you know this type of control on multiple pages or screens in this actual app I do uh, so that's why it's probably better in that case to set it initially and then I can just reuse it uh, multiple times. What's also awesome about that is um, where if you have fly out menus where you're not sure what the data is going to look like for the fly out menu and you, you want to reuse that component, you could very easily do it in this fashion. You can have one fly out menu and you can display multiple data sets using the same reusable um, fly out menu, which is brilliant. So this is fantastic. Cool. Um, I also did try uh, a form. So you've got the form control. I tried that as well, but I, I also really battled to get it uh, to look the way I wanted to. I had to unlock, you know, lots of uh, controls on the form um, and I couldn't get the spacing right. So I just struggled with the form. And because this is not something that's actually going to be editable in this case, it's not being written back, um, you know, just for display purposes, I thought this was the best way of doing it. Yeah, form is also very heavy. There's there's a lot of controls inside of a form, so this is a much better way of doing doing it than a form. Cool. Um, just maybe expanding on this a bit, my love of gallery controls. Uh, I came across this uh, blog the other day um, using business process flows in Canvas apps. Um, this is like you know on a scale of uh, complexity from one to 10, one being very basic, 10 being the most complex app you've ever seen in your life, this is 10. Okay, so um, it's it's super complicated, but w w what the person's doing here is, is also really smart. So um, almost everything on this app is a gallery control. This um, status or this progress indicator at the top of employee onboarding is a, is a gallery control. Um, this over here, the employee information, first name, last name, contact, 
this is also gallery control. And it's so, he's got really smart here. What he's actually doing is this, these sets of controls are in quotes being rendered dynamically. So um, when, the, when the app is designed, the app designer doesn't know that there's a first name field, a last name field, et cetera. These are actually added um, into something called a business process flow. Um, so this is something that's been around in Dynamics for a while. Uh, and so you can go and define the fields that you want somewhere else. Uh, and then the app at runtime um, renders uh, these, these controls here. And basically what he's got is a gallery control. And then in each row, let's call it, he's got a text box, a label, uh, a, a, a date uh, control and a, a, a toggle. Um, and then based on what field it should be, it, it hides the rest and shows the one that should be there. So uh, all of this here is just a whole bunch of gallery controls, but this, this is super complicated uh, in the way it's being done. But you know, maybe if you're interested in, in, in what I've been talking about here in this app, it's certainly something to, to look at. It's called using business process flows in a Canvas app. Um, so instead of using this kind of dynamics, a model driven kind of uh, user experience where you've got the business process flow at the top here and the fields defined here. Um, he creates a canvas app uh, and he's got a whole bunch of versions on UIs and just a nice way of, of, of creating really sexy UIs for business process flows. Anyway, um, I kind of digress. Question uh, number three or issue number three I had was, um, yes, I remember now, let me do it. So what I was doing is I was using a table. So I'm going to insert a data table. Okay, so here's my table. Uh, and let me bind it to the same data set. How's that? Uh, where is this call? User profile. Let's do that. Let's put it here. Let's just change the fields. And remember, there's a name and a value field. There we go. So let's add those in. So here's my my table and it all looks good and I'm trying to figure out and I'm really hoping someone can help me here how do I change some of these um, uh, ways that like some of the columns work so this header row here it's got name and value I want name to be aligned on the left not in the middle and I cannot figure out how to do that. I can change the header text from name to full name perhaps. Um, and I can go here and I can change, you know, the heading full, but I can't figure out how to take full name and align it to the left. So why, I thought you're in love with galleries. So is that the answer? <laughs> <laughs> if so, <laughs> I should probably not use a table. Look, from a styling perspective, you have a lot more um, options in in a in a gallery. But what you could do, and this is a little bit of an ugly hack, but it it'll work, is if you actually just have the the columns as blank, so you don't display the column names, and then you can just drag labels on top of the the table where the column name should be. And you can uh, then just put the label wherever you want. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Cool idea. I like that. Okay. Thanks, dude. Yeah, I found that the tables are, um, they've improved a lot. Um, and there's quite a cool new set of features in, in tables. Previously, it was very hard just to even change the header. Um, but uh, you're right. Maybe I should just stay with galleries. Eh? Galleries are the, are the way forward. You should just be careful with that city name. You know, before you know it, you might have people knocking on your door. <laughs> this is this is not me, hey. This is Anastasia. Okay, so perfect. So question three, uh, answer is: Do a fudge like hide the top row and put other two labels on top of it, or three labels, whatever you need, or don't use a table. If you can't get it to format right, use a gallery. Cool. That ends my questions. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. That was really cool. 
Um, we are almost at time. Are there any other general questions from the audience? I'm going to open the mic up now to everybody. Anyone wants to comment, add anything else? Have any questions? Okay, we take silence as there's nothing. So with that, thank you everyone for your time. I hope you found this informative. We will be sharing a link to the presentations as well as the video uh, over the next couple of days on our YouTube channel. Thanks everyone. Appreciate your time. Have a good evening further. Stay safe. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks Chris. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks Jonathan. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.